You know, there are a lot of great singing groups around, and that's certainly a great one today. I want to talk with you just a minute, and I promise I'll be very brief, but uh, about a different singing group, a uh, potential singing group, not exactly the one you've heard of, the Rolling Stones, but Jesus introduces us to a potential music group out called the Singing Stones. You read, or perhaps listened as it was read, when the religious leaders told Jesus to hush his crowd, hush his followers from praising him. He said, if they didn't praise me, the stones will cry out. These rocks on the Jerusalem road that would shout praise for God if no one else was willing to do so. Consider with me this statement from Jesus. One, it was a challenge to the religious establishment. It was kind of a shut your mouth moment to the Pharisees. Near the end of Jesus' earthly phase of ministry, he had no more time for the foolishness of the religious professionals. Now maybe they had a legitimate concern. During this time of the year, as the, the Jews got worked up with patriotic fervor, there was always the possibility of a revolt against the Romans. In fact, the Roman officials usually sent extra military personnel into Jerusalem during the Passover season out of fear that some trouble could happen. And the Pharisees did not want trouble with the Romans. Or maybe they were just jealous of the fact that Jesus could draw a crowd, and they couldn't. You know, some people are so insecure, they can't stand for someone else to get credit or attention or praise. Maybe these Pharisees were jealous of Jesus and his popularity with the people, their people. But the Pharisees are not our biggest concern this morning. Jesus' words to the Pharisees about the rocks being able to give praise to him if no one else did, not only was a challenge to the Pharisees, it was a challenge to Jesus' followers, those of the first century and those of the 21st century. The truth is, God desires praise. Not only that, God deserves praise. And there are many, many, many reasons why we should praise God. We don't have time today to list them all. Perhaps the greatest reason for praise is the salvation and fullness of life we have through God's gift to us of Jesus. The Bible teaches us that praise is the responsibility of creation. And human beings at the pinnacle of creation have the most responsibility to praise God. But like many other responsibilities... If the one responsible does not step up, someone, in this case something, something else may do it. Jesus didn't fight with the religious leaders over the issue of praise. He simply stated a spiritual reality. God has so ordered God's creation that God will be praised. God desires that people lead that praise, but if not... If people are not willing to step up, there will still be praise. What happens when we don't praise God? God still gets praise. God will create something or God will orchestrate something with creation to bring Him praise. But when people don't praise God, we lose out on the relationship that praise brings about. The relationship with God that begins with obedience and God demands praise and our failure to praise hampers our relationship because it is an example of disobedience. The disciples that day, and not just the twelve, there was a larger group of disciples. The disciples' praise of Jesus that day helped cement their understanding of Jesus and deepen their relationship with Him. Now, definitely the deeper understanding and relationship came in the days of head after Jesus' death and resurrection. But the events of that Palm Sunday were remembered later by the post-resurrection disciples. And those memories helped give them the courage to stay faithful to Jesus even after Jesus returned to heaven. 
Those disciples praise God on that road leading into the heart of Jerusalem. Think about it. Praise is not limited to what we do in church or maybe even not primarily what we do just in church. True praise becomes part of a lifestyle. Praise is, is an essential component of that lifestyle of worship we talked about last week. Praise is, is a part of recognizing God and God's presence and, and God's involvement in our daily lives. And all of that recognition is a key to praising as part of worship. Praise is a, is a willingness to credit God for good things. Good things that are in our lives. Good things that are happening to us. Rather than uh, taking credit ourselves with our intelligence or our hard work, we praise God because we recognize our intelligence and our hard work and our ingenuity all is a part of God's gifting to us. We praise God when we do some of those hard things that we couldn't do if God wasn't working in us. Think about the last time you befriended an unfriendly person. You, you have done that. Think about the last time you befriended an unfriendly person. The, the ability, the, the strength to do that came from God. Now you say it came from within me, yes, but God put it within you. Praise God for giving you the ability to do those kinds of hard things. God deserves praise, and God will be praised. Jesus wanted his followers that day, and he wants us to know God can be praised by us. But if it wasn't them, and if it's not us, God will raise up something in creation to praise Him. But we can choose to do it. The crowd praised God that day for something very specific. Go back and read that passage. They praised God for peace in heaven. It's quite possible that they saw Jesus as an example of some notion of peace. But I want to tell you this morning, Jesus is not an example of peace or an example of freedom. Jesus is peace. He was their peace. Jesus is our peace. He's not just an example of peace to us. He is our peace. Jesus was not just an example of freedom to them. He was their freedom in the midst of the confinement of the Roman Empire. Jesus is our freedom from whatever seeks to entangle us. If you want to be free, you'll find Jesus as your freedom. Jesus is not an example of some noble life tragically ended in execution. Jesus is life. Jesus is hope. Jesus is peace. And friends, until we find Jesus as our peace we will never find true peace. Jesus is the only one who can quiet the wars within our own hearts, someone has said. You see, it's Jesus who comes as a new king of kings. Most kings come at the head of an army, imposing a kind of peace and justice perhaps, but usually at the end of a sword. Jesus comes not on a war horse, but on a donkey as the king of peace. We are challenged today by the political implications of King Jesus, implications that are well beyond our typical political loyalties. Jesus comes as the prince of peace, but at a price. Even as the crowds cheered him, Jesus could hear beyond those cheers nails being driven into the cross. That's the price Jesus willingly paid for our peace. And as we recognize Jesus as the King of peace and His willing payment for our peace, we will be energized to praise. Make no mistake, if we are not willing to praise God, God will raise up someone or something that will give him praise. 
Will you praise God today? Let's pray together. Lord God, thank you for the joy that we sense as we celebrate together a parade with our sisters and brothers from 20 centuries ago. Lord, may we join them today with our voices and our hearts celebrating Jesus coming into our lives for the first time or celebrating Jesus leading us in our lives one more step. As we celebrate today as children lead, may we rejoice and give you praise through the way we live, the way we talk, the way we treat those around us, the way we prepare for our eternity with you. We pray these things together in Jesus' name. Amen.